Hey everyone and welcome back to Build UX. In this episode, we're going to be starting a new series and are going to be building the nutrition UI design by Giga Tamarashvili on Dribbble. I've linked to this design in the video description and you can always find all the needed links and starter assets in the GitHub repo for each project. This project is going to follow the four step process of discover, structure, style, and test. For now, we'll focus on the project discovery step. So to start off the discovery for this project, I brought the dribble shot in the Figma so we can analyze what's going on in the design and better plan what we're going to build. The first thing we're going to do is just take a look at the design as a whole and come up with an overall plan of how we're going to build this thing out and maybe some problem areas with the design in terms of accessibility. Just really get a good familiarity with what we're presented here in the visual design and come up with a good plan going forward. So looking at this design, it looks like we have a global header and navigation area the brand, search input, some global navigation links, and also a menu button that would open an off-screen menu. That's not shown in this design, but it might be something we build out as well. Next up, we have a sidebar, and that looks like it has some featured articles with cards, and then it looks like a section selector in the bottom left here. We also have the main content area, we have the headline, the actual content of the article, some supporting images, some nutrition facts, and also a sharing section down here. So already there's some patterns that we can glean from this design. First off, in terms of typography, it looks like we only have two typefaces. The first one is this sans serif typeface that's used through a lot of the UI elements as well as a body copy. And then we have this more display serif typeface that's used for the headline and also the section selector. Other things we can clearly see is that there's actually a pretty limited color palette, which is always nice as a start. You don't wanna have too many colors going on. And this really helps to unify the design. So we can see that we have this dark kind of charcoal gray. We have a lighter version, which I can already tell is pretty low contrast and is probably a problem for accessibility. We also have this accent red color. Again, this in conjunction with the white might be an issue for accessibility. So we'll definitely want to check up on that. So the first thing I've done with this reference design is I've recreated all of the elements in Figma. So that way we can actually modify them and kind of get a sense of how everything's constructed out. So as you can see in this first step, Everything is pretty close to the reference. We had to find some Google font alternatives for the custom fonts that were used in this design. And there were some slightly different, you know, line lengths and things with the typography. But overall, we tried to keep pretty close to the original layout. Another thing you'll notice is that compared to the reference, some of the colors have changed a little bit here. Now, mainly what I found when I was looking at the colors is that there was low contrast on a couple of them. So this lighter gray only had a two to one contrast ratio and that red in conjunction with the white did not have enough contrast to pass accessibility standards. So what I've done is just darken the gray a little bit so it has more than a 4.5 to one contrast ratio. I've done the same thing with that red and it just barely passes but this should be good for text of all sizes. So going back to our recreation here everything is pretty much the same again you know all the alignment of the original design is intact and we just introduced the new accessible colors. We also have our alternative Google font choices that all replicate the feel of each of the typefaces that were in the original design as well. So as you can see, still pretty close match. Now the final step with any design discovery, or if you're kind of recreating a design from scratch, is to really bring a little more systemic approach to the spacing of the elements, uh, a little more rhythm in terms of the value used for line heights, font sizes, and also think through any ex further accessibility considerations or any statefulness that you'll have to have in your design. So when we compare this final step of this design recreation with the original, you can see that there's some pretty substantial changes in the layout. Overall, I think if you were looking at one or the other in isolation, you wouldn't really notice that they're that different. But what we've done is basically bring in some consistent spacing values to all of the individual elements and the white space in between them. So here you can see I have these custom spacer elements that I use in a lot of my designs. This orange one is 128 pixel square. Next up we have a 64 pixel square item and a 32 pixel square one. Now in a lot of a lot of my work, I always stick to increments of four. Um, you can use two as well if you need to go down that small, like for some of the widths of these decorative elements. But in terms of spacing, I try to try to keep it four or eight pixels and then keep doubling the scale from there. So we have two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, etc. I rarely need 256 as a spacer, um, but sometimes that comes up as well. But as you can see in this design, the biggest unit that we have repeated throughout is 128 pixels. 
So what this does is it really creates a lot of rhythm in our design. We're sticking to an eight pixel grid overall. And also it's much easier when it comes time to actually code this design out because we know predictable margins and paddings to put on each of these elements. So in addition to bringing a little more rules around the spacing of this app, another thing I did at this stage, just kind of as part of this discovery in terms of planning how we're gonna build this thing out, is I created a grid overlay as a potential plan of how we'll build this article section out. One tricky thing with this is that there's obviously a lot of rules around how different things align. So you can see that the right edge of the headline aligns with the left edge of the supporting image. Uh, the bottom edge of the supporting image also aligns with the top of the nutrition panel as well as the other image. And you can see that there are, again, if we bring back our spacing values, some fixed kind of margins or gutters between different typography elements and within the sections themselves. So this is something we might use CSS Grid to achieve, but we'll definitely fill that out once we get into the building stage of this project. Another thing you'll notice, and this is a subtle change, the reference showed that our navigation didn't have any underlining on these top navigation links. Now it's important to consider that when your links don't have a color that highly contrasts with the regular content in your UI, you need to provide some other visual alternative to indicate that they are interactive or that they're links. So for these featured article links, obviously these are cards, they have these carrot icons, they have a different shape, they're very noticeable, they have a lot of visual affordance to them. But if we were to look back at the reference for these top navigation links, yes, contextually, a lot of the time, you'll probably guess that this is a link because it's in the top navigation. However, I've, I've seen links styled this way before that are in body copy alongside very similar text and there's no other visual indication with a really distinct color that they're actually interactive elements. So just to make sure that we're always bringing a dedicated visual affordance to links that need to show that they're interactive, what I've done is just give them a really nice, you know, subtle underline here. And this is by default, you know, what we expect from links. I don't think it really compromises the clean look of this design, so we're definitely going to keep going forward with this. And it's nice to know that we're meeting accessibility needs as well. So that's pretty much it in terms of looking at the design and kind of gleaning whatever information we can. Now what we need to think about is what assets we'll need from this design to actually build this thing out. So there are some custom icons throughout this design. First off, we have this little search icon. We have this menu icon over here. We have a couple of these carrot icons. They're slightly different sizes, so I think that uh, we'll probably want to export the right variation, the up and down, all separately, just so that way we don't have to rotate them after the fact. And that way we know uh, we can actually export them with a certain tap target size that's suitable for users on mobile, as well as just not having to be too precise with those clicks. Lastly, we have some Facebook and Twitter icons, and I just got these from Font Awesome. Really, if you can find a nice clean SVG of these that matches the default branding for the social media icons, it really doesn't matter where you get it from. In terms of images, we have these two images, which actually I found on Unsplash as well. And so I was able to match the design exactly, but we have the berry in the bowl image over here. And then it looks like we have some chia seed pudding as well. So we'll be able to pull those at full resolution and I'll provide these as exports in terms of icons, fonts needed and images all together uh, in the starter files for the GitHub repo for this project. The last thing that we need to consider is states of UI that we see in this design that aren't covered by the design itself. So a couple obvious ones would be hover interactions. So as a general rule, I think what I'm going to do is anything that is this darker gray will hover to this lighter gray that's used in the body copy below. So we can expect to see that as the interaction pattern for the nutrition brand up top, any of these links, the menu and its associated icon, the search icon, social icons, etc. So really any of those I think we can keep consistent as a pattern. Now even though this card on the left does use this primary gray, we could lighten it to be the secondary gray. What I found is because we had to change this red to barely pass contrast standards, the only choice we have as a hover pattern for this card, let me show you here real quick, is to actually darken it. So if I turn on a layer that just shows what the hover interaction might look like for this card, you see that we'll have to darken it. So if we then had the card right below it also 
uh, or I should say, instead of darkening, it will lighten to match this other gray. That would be kind of a weird pattern where one darkens, one lightens. So instead, I think we need an actual dedicated color for this other card, and that one will darken as well. Now, a couple other things that are a little bit trickier and are not shown in this design are the interaction patterns and the open states of both this global search up top and the main menu. So these are things that we'll probably address when we scaffold out the HTML code for this UI, but we will have to see if we're actually gonna build out fully interactive versions of it. I think in any case, what we'll wanna do is code up versions of both open and closed UI for each of these components, and then we'll just manually kind of apply or remove the class that's needed to expand or show them. But we probably won't get into any JavaScript at this stage that'll actually wire it up to be able to click these triggers to open those elements up. So as I mentioned, we now have a pretty good catalog of everything we'll need in terms of starter assets and information to successfully build out this UI. So in this Figma file, which I'll also include in the video description, we have our color palette that we'll use to build it out. Please note that the ones with the red contrast ratios are the old ones from the reference design that we won't be using. So pretty much everything else is set in stone at this point. You can see we're passing contrast ratios for all of these and we'll be able to point them to specific either components or interaction states like this darker red is for hover, for example. Same with this darkest gray up here. I also exported all the icons that we need for this project. Uh, you know, so a few of these were custom made for this, and then a couple were just generic social media icons. Those are already sized as needed for appropriate tap target sizes, or at least to provide nice even units on the eight pixel grid, so we can provide some padding around that with the buttons that'll contain them. All right, so I think that about does it for the discovery step of this project. It's pretty straightforward. Again, there's not too much complexity going on in this UI, but there are some interesting interaction patterns we'll have to think through. And I think the main challenge of this will really be achieving this grid layout. However we want to go about it, we can either kind of hard code values or use CSS grid. We'll have to kind of feel that out once we get to that styling stage. But as part of the next step, we're really just going to focus on the structure step of the process where we're going to build out the HTML for this project. So I think that does it for this episode. Be sure to check out the next episode in which we start this structure step of the process and we'll get into our code editor.